Welcome everyone to another Data on Kubernetes meetup. And I shouldn't just say another Data on Kubernetes meetup because this Data on Kubernetes meetup number 37, which is one of my favorite numbers, is a very special one because we've got an extremely special person with us. As usual, my name is Bart Farrell. It's wonderful to be here. I always insist you can follow us on Twitter. You can check us out on LinkedIn. You can join our Slack. I was telling Steve in the beginning that whatever we don't get to today, we will definitely address those questions in Slack. So please check out our Slack. Um, we're always looking for speakers as well. Whether you're an end user, you're working in any capacity that has to do with data on Kubernetes, please contact me. We have lots of meetups planned now, very proud to say all the way until August, um, but definitely looking to, to fill out the rest of the year. Steven, if you know anyone, please feel free to recommend as well. Steven Bailey is our guest today. And I have to say with a lot of pride, Dr. Steven Bailey, more interesting than the fact that he is a PhD, he lives in a city that is in three counties. Stephen, first of all, hello. And can you please tell us a little bit about, about where you're living? <laughs> hey, Bart. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I live in Dublin, Ohio, which is just outside of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and it's a, it's a great little town. It's got um, right on the edge of the, the, city, the city boundaries, really. It's, it's, you turn right and you go to the suburbs and, and you got Target and Kroger and all that stuff. You turn left, you got 100 miles of cornfields. Um, so... That's that's where I live. I like to to have the options open to me uh, for how I'm feeling <laughs> any any given day. <laughs> and which county would you say that you live in out of the three? Uh, I I live in Franklin. I live. Okay, in okay, city. that okay. So that is established. That is established. Yeah. Then. All right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, that's important to know, and it's also important to know in terms of fun facts because it's always interesting to learn. Dublin, Ohio, is the birthplace of Wendy's, I believe. Yep. Yep. That's correct. Yeah, and uh, Phil, Mil Phil Mickelson. We have a, a golf tournament here every year, Memorial Golf Tournament. Hey, also good. This is good. This is good. Yeah. It's important to learn things. And we'll get some other things we're going to learn as well, too. Um, not just technical related, <laughs> maybe not just about Wendy's and golf tournaments and, tr and three counties, one city, but it's always fun to mix in other things because Stephen has a really cool background. Um, you did your undergraduate in both chemistry and philosophy. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And, and I always, I always uh, thought that chemistry would be the one that would make me my uh, my living, and then philosophy would be the one that uh, you know was the love and the passion, and and teaches me to be a better person. And, and to what that's extent? Actually, what, born out. I would say that's born out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But the thing is, is that there are very much philosophical questions involved in your work, as we will look at later when we're talking about data governance, privacy, GDPR. Um, you know, at what point is it? Well, if I want a company to provide a good service, I'm willing to give up some of my personal data as opposed to maybe this isn't 100% clear and you know, that sometimes things can be a little bit misleading. These are questions that are important, more philosophical or moral questions, ethical questions that companies need to be having. Um, but anyway, you got your PhD. What did you get your, your what, did you, what, what were you studying? I was studying how kids learn to read and how the brain rewires itself um, as children learn to read. Uh, so... You know, over the course of about five years, we brought in kids every summer, um, gave them reading tests, and then and then took uh, MRI images of their brain and, and looked at how uh, both the function and the structure of the brain changed um, as as part you know auditory and visual and semantic areas uh, became very tightly interconnected. It was super fascinating work. Really taught me that I loved science and that we don't understand the brain uh, as much as we we would like to, but. Um, it's, it's really an incredible, incredible area of, um, of research. I, I can imagine. And I'm just very grateful that no one has bothered to look at my brain yet because I think the results would be frightening. <laughs> you never know uh, what you're going to find. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's also interesting too. And maybe we can get to that a little bit later is because you're talking about, you know, rewiring and how we learn things. And for some folks out there, like jumping into the Kubernetes space um, is a little bit daunting. And some folks might say that there is a question of rewiring. And then when we talk about data on Kubernetes even more so, you know, that's why today we just tweeted, you know, data on Kubernetes is just to see what kind of responses we get. Um, and that a lot of it, as much as we talk about technologies, is a question of mindset, of culture, approach, understanding, empathy, all those other things that will play into there. Um, now we can get a little bit started more into Immuta and curious about your role there. But as a starting point, you know, Immuta is very much focused on data governance. So yesterday in our Slack, um, I was asking you for a definition of, of data governance. I'm just going to try to paraphrase what you mentioned. Um, so data governance is like all the things parents have to do to make sure children don't run with scissors. As a child who ran with scissors and probably lots of other dangerous objects, I can really, I can empathize with that. 
but then the questions below are, do the kids know what scissors are? Are the scissors in a cabinet up high? Do the kids know where they can run and with what? And are parents monitoring what the kids are doing? So with these sort of parameters regarding data governance, I think that I think it's a really nice definition because we find tons of definitions for data governance. We find tons of different definitions for, uh, for data quality, uh, for what's the definition of raw data or not. Once again, someone who's coming from the academic world that's then moved very much into the professional world, um, I, think, I, I think your perspective is certainly a unique one. How did you get started with Immuta? Or how did Immuta get started with you? We can put it that way. <laughs> um, you know, I think it was, it was one of those things where I was looking for a long time I, and a lot of doors closed, um, you know, as I was fin finishing up my PhD and, and this one opened and it was just the perfect fit. Um, I, you know, working with uh, medical imaging data and working with children's data, um, you know, all of those are, are very sensitive. And so I had, I had experience working with, you know, institutional review boards and other governance sort of structures that have been around since the 1960s um, at, at, in academic institutions. And so coming into a, uh, a MUTA and thinking through, okay, how can we start thinking about data governance, which I think most modern practitioners, like, um, you know, perhaps most of your audience kind of think of it as, as this stodgy business initiative. Um, how do we take that and really think through the, uh, you know, how do we operationalize that, you know, and like, what does that really amount to? And this, and you know, it's, it's been an amazing space uh, to work in because it's so dynamic. We, there's, no, there's no answer out there yet, um, but I really think that the field is starting to gravitate towards the idea of metadata, like metadata, the purposeful use of metadata and the purposeful like management and, and um, operational, operationalization of metadata is, is what data governance really amounts to um, in the modern stack. So, and can, and can we specify right there too as well? Do you find that metadata is a term that's misunderstood with the same degree of frequency as data governance or you feel that's more codified that, that folks agree on that? I think what's hard about metadata is um, you have to define a framework or else it just proliferates, right? Because metadata can be anything. Um, and every system has their own set of metadata. So you have to, you have to understand like, as the data team, hey, we want to know these three attributes about all of our processes. And we need to be able to say like, yeah, this data is on time. It's fresh. It's meeting quality checks. It's given to the right people. Like there are certain guarantees that you can only, like you require metadata for um, to build an SLA off of. But you have to be very purposeful about setting that up on the front end or you're kind of hosed uh, down the line. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, all right, so with that in mind, um, if you wanna share your screen, show us your presentation, I think we can jump right into that. Once again, just for all the folks out there, please feel free to put questions in the chat or directly on our Slack or on Twitter, wherever you want. Um, and we will, we will try to handle them uh, accordingly as, as the talk moves forward. Sure. All right. Um, all right, so you know, what, what I've prepared today is actually to, to focus on, uh, not so much the governance part, but, but mostly on how we use Argo workflows, um, which is a Kubernetes native orchestration layer for our data pipeline at Amuda. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Amuda, what our product does a little bit, just to give some context around our team and, and our stack. Um, but the bulk of it, we'll be talking about the replication, the replication um, approach we use. But you know, feel free to drop, drop uh, comments and questions and stuff in the, in the Slack. And Bart, feel free to interrupt me at any time if like something is particularly salient. I'll have a couple. Of okay, we'll do. All right, so just a quick outline of where we want to go. Uh, talk about our data team, our stack, and objectives. Talk about Argo workflows a little bit, and then how we implemented it. And then some considerations if you wanted to do the um, the same thing at your uh, on your team. So our team, as, as Bart kind of mentioned, uh, Immuta, the company was founded in 2015. Um, really the uh, initial product was a policy engine, um, basically a Postgres database that uh, had foreign data wrappers that pushed, pushed down um, queries to a backing database and gave uh, returned policy enforced data to the querier, um, usually a, a person. 
So for example, you could create a masking policy that says mask all PII across all of my data in all of my servers. And then someone querying through us would always get mass data unless they had certain exceptions. Um, we've since started focusing on making the data platform like Databricks or Snowflake the, um, the source of truth for those policies. And so instead of having data come through Amuta, Amuta pushes the policies down into the database. And it makes for a very nice way of doing, um, a, a taking a holistic approach to access control and data governance. Um, a lot of policies, um, a lot of policies you can implement, but th that's not what this talk is about. So that's just a little bit about what we as a company um, work on. And my team at the company, the growth analytics team, we are, are essentially responsible for the internal um, data stack that all of our different departments, sales, product, marketing, delivery, operations, uh, use for operational reporting and board reporting um, type of needs. So everyone's got their like their source applications, whether it's Salesforce or Pardot or Jira. Each individual team can kind of do their some of basic reporting in those applications. But as soon as you want to start creating um, reporting that we want to get up to the board and like having to put data quality checks and validation and integrating across systems, like that's where my team steps in and, and starts producing those data models and, and dashboards. So in, in many ways, I think we're a fairly typical um, a fairly typical data team at a startup. We have a modern, the modern data stack implemented in which we use um, Stitch to pull data from the, the source system, generally Stitch to pull data from the source systems. We extract and load it into a Snowflake warehouse where it lands as raw data. We use DBT to transform it into gold data. And then um, we do use our product, Immuta, to get metadata from those um, operational processes and metadata from our uh, user identity management system to create policy enforced views in Snowflake, which uh, data consumers can access through Looker or Snowsite, Snowflake's new um, you know, UI or Jupyter Notebooks or whatever the tool is. So. Um, I, I kind of think of this as having a data layer, a metadata layer, and a consumption layer. And uh, over here on the on the left hand side, you would have Argo workflows uh, doing some of the orchestration. Just to drill down a little bit into this, um, in another view, uh, on the left hand side of our pipeline, where we have raw data coming in, we have you know data from Fivetran, data from Stitch, data from um, Argo workflows or custom data loaders lands in, Amuta uses, creates the policy enforced views, which, which users access. Um, I wanted to share these diagrams, not just because I worked on them recently <laughs> and put a lot of time into making them pretty, uh, but because um, I think it's, it's a nice way of, of saying that the talk today will be focusing on this custom data loader portion. Um, our, and, and to emphasize the fact that our team uses kind of the standard ELT um, workflow for creating data products. One interesting point here, uh, the pain point that we were really trying to solve is we have, you know, we have Stitch and Fivetran, but there's sort of this long tail of integrations that um, you have to pull in from custom data sources, whether that's like, you know, our, uh, some, some employee HR app or like some, you know, some fairly small um, SaaS tool that the product team wants to spin up to track like uh, feature requests or things like that. So there's like, I'd say, you know, 10 of our 30 integrations are in that category, which require just a little bit of custom development that we want to really templatize and run on a schedule in the same way that we do our other systems. So that's the problem, getting this, this long tail of custom data into our warehouse so that we can do uh, transform and dashboarding on it. And a couple of, of pieces, well, let me let me stop here for a second. Does anyone have any questions we want to tackle? I'm I'm just curious, is I'm curious in terms of because you were mentioning previously about uh, you know your experience in academia with the kind of data that you were dealing with. And obviously, you know, if we're thinking NDA is complicated, the sensitivity of you know children's brains, I think obviously is quite uh, you know, goes even further. 
Well, with this in mind, because you were talking about, you know, the, the ELT, you know, and previously hearing about ETL and different ways of looking at things. Was there a mentality or way of looking at things sort of difference that you found from your academic work to compared to when you started working with the team in Immuta? Um, yeah, that's interesting. So one of the things you have to do on the, in academia, even before you write a grant, uh, to do some research is you have to create a proposal for how you're going to protect the data and how you're going to protect your research subjects. Mm. Um, that's not the case in uh, business. In right? which case, like, it comes after. <laughs> yeah, how much? <laughs> how much? How much is the fine? We'll pay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, it's very possible, and, and I've lived this. Um, it's very possible for the the data savvy person to connect, like, you know, gigabytes of sensitive data into a data warehouse without anybody really like knowing or caring or asking, like, hey, what you know, is this right? <laughs> Should you be doing this? Um, and so. One thing I really like about the ELT workflow is it has a couple of stages in, in it. So there's like logical separation of things that you do. So um, you have your source system, you extract and load, boom, you have like this raw area, which we can, um, you know, set some boundaries over. That's like step one, right? So if you want to prevent access there, you can kind of, you can kind of understand like, okay, this is a, a, a discrete step in my, my processing. And then you have transform and then you have ex ex exposure release. So the, definitely the, you know, the focus on thinking ahead is different in academia versus um, thinking ahead from governance standpoint is different in academia and business. But uh, there are opportunities, I think, for, for people in the line of business to implement like access controls in a, in a meaningful way or other controls. All right. So there is, there is somewhat of a learning curve, but nothing that can't be overcome. But like you said, it's, it's a question of mentality is that in, in one, you have to do all that paperwork before you even get started. In the other one, you might be doing it as you go or, or later or, you know, in, in a different order. Yeah. And often there's not a, um, not a governing body at the organization who's going to push you to say, Hey, you know, are you thinking about protecting your data in the right way? Like, should we be using this? Should we be exposing this? Um, that's definitely a challenge and at small organizations too. Yeah. In, in the case of, you know, because of me being in Europe, um, you know, and we were talking about this before we got started, is that I've been hearing about GDPR, you know, the General Data Protection Regulation since 2017. Basically, depending on the size of your company, you would have to hire a chief data officer, a chief data protection officer. Everyone would have to go through an extensive training about how things would have to be done. All these emails had to be sent out you know, from different companies warning, you know, their customers. In the beginning, the whole feeling was, okay, the EU government um, probably won't go after anyone for the first year or so. There will be a bit of a grace period. But now those fines are starting to arrive. And, and there are cases uh, of companies getting slapped with, with serious penalties um, for not respecting this kind of stuff. So then I think in, in general, in the U.S., data protection maybe isn't as, as strict in, in some areas, which is also why being in Europe, there are websites in the U.S. that I can't access because of that. Um, for different reasons, even for some websites just to read the news, like in my hometown and things like that, they say, you know, because of European data regulations, we're not allowed uh, to, to let you access the site from there. So like I said, this is this is definitely an up and coming thing and or up and coming, it's a very, very big thing. As you said previously, there is no definitive answer. Do you expect a worldwide answer to be achieved in the next 10 years? I suppose that's uh, enough material for an entire separate conversation, <laughs> but uh, just really quickly, how do you see that? Yeah, I don't know. Um, and I don't, we have some folks on our team who are, are like legal experts in this area. And it's really, it's always really exciting for me to, um, to talk with them about, you know, what, wh where this is going from a big picture perspective. I, I, you know, I'm often preoccupied with just the, like the small picture of how do we do this? Like, if we want to uh, remove someone from our database, you know, and I've got like this fairly small startup, you know, set of database that I can't have a high degree of control over. How do we do that effectively, right? Like, how can we even do the right thing on a small scale? Um, and I think we're still learning as a community what those operational best practices are. Um, I think um, probably there's consensus that it seems like there's consensus on best practices for data operations starting to form, you know, version, can, things like version control, config as code, you know, separating uh, compute and transform and, uh, and all these things. Um, it, my hope is that in 10 years, we have 
uh, anybody, anybody new coming into the space trying to build a data platform um, will have an understanding of, hey, here's how I can protect my data and really be proactive about um, you know, making sure that customer, whatever the regulations end up being, like we can adhere to them, you know, proactively rather than having some big governance initiative or getting that happens on the back end or, you know, getting fined, obviously. Mm -hmm. Cool. Good. Let's go. Argo workflows. Let's do it. All right. (laughs) Okay. So just to reiterate, the objective here is to load data sources not supported by Stitcher 5 chain reliably in the data warehouse. Now there's also some sub objectives here. Um, if we want to, if we want to push data out of the warehouse, if we want to do a, a model that we want to train or something like that, like an orchestrator is obviously generally useful. So um, we, we do want to address those problems, but this is about the replication side. And so I want to talk about uh, a, a tool that we came upon called Singer, which is what's used by Stitch. It's basically a framework, a Python framework for um, replicating data. And the reason we gravitated towards this was because um, I know Python. I don't know anything else. Uh, <laughs> kind of dumb in that way. Well, you know uh, something. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we, you know, we needed scheduler, and we knew we had many sources. And and one, like we had a couple of destinations. We actually started on Redshift and wanted to migrate to Snowflake. Um, and our engineering team, so other experts in the company, were Kubernetes experts. Um, so speaking in a language like the container language, I felt would would open me up to having a lot more support across my team um, versus using something like Airflow where I know I'm the only one who's ever going to understand Airflow. And I didn't really want to understand Airflow in, anyways. Um, well, that's I guess that's that's about why we gravitated to Argo. But the way Singer works is you basically have a... Um, it's highly composable. So you have an extractor and you have a loader. Then the extractor is called a, a tap and the loader is called a target. Um, and so that lets you take any, you know, you can take five taps and take five targets and you can get five times five, all the combinations uh, of them because the tap basically outputs a stream in a, a JSON schema spec that the target can read and then write into the database. And there's a, a, a decent community around Singer um, and a number of, of taps that are available that are either, they either work out of the box or they work with some, uh, with some additional uh, work. When we started thinking about Orchestrator, uh, I saw a great, this great talk on, uh, from the Data Council on Kubernetes native orchestration with Argo. Um, and, you know, in this talk, the presenter compares it to Airflow and, and um, basically makes a case that uh, there's a lot of advantages to having a container native um, orchestration layer where you, you don't even have to think about like what all of the Ar- Airflow like um, particularities. You can, you can create YAML files that reference containers and just have an entry point script in, that, are, that are very similar to the way you write other Kubernetes um, resources or operators. I don't know. I don't know the difference. Um, one. We're flexible. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> I'm not, I'm, I, and, and like, here's some, something else. I'm actually not a, I'm not a Kubernetes expert myself. Um, I have a decent amount of, inf- a decent amount of knowledge of um, administrating it, but like, as soon as it gets to ingress, uh, that's, that's the boundary of my knowledge. I can't, I can't figure it out for no matter how hard I try. <laughs> It was, we're talking about, you know, rewiring brain evolution, all these kind of things. Everyone's at a different stage and it's not a big deal. It's just important to be open about it as you just were. So it's all good. Yep. Um, so we ended up choosing Argo workflows um, because we liked the uh, containerized, the container focus. I could get some resources from other, other teams. Um, it allowed for some standardization of scripts and environments within containers. So instead of, uh, yeah, didn't I? You know, kind of like natively would uh, be able to inject whatever environment I wanted, um, and I didn't have to learn Airflow, which is which was a main goal. What I what I wanted. The deployment of Argo itself is pretty straightforward, but I think the strategy took a little bit of thought and a little bit of iteration. And that's what I want to talk about um, in a couple slides that I did write a tutorial on towards data science on this topic, which I think is how Bart found me. Um, and you're welcome to go there. It's got a little like quick start demo. Um, you can, you can spin up, a 
spin up a, a tap workflow pretty quickly um, and, and kind of see it in action. But I'll also do, uh, I wanna show you kind of like what the logic of it looks like and then I'll show you um, what it looks like. So as I mentioned before, there's two components to a Singer pipeline or Singer workflow. The first is the tap that connects to a service, extracts data and then emits a standardized stream schemas um, and records. In Argo, when you're passing artifacts between one container in a, in a workflow to another container in a workflow, it uses S3 to, as a, an intermediate layer. So basically the tap will uh, emit the stream, you, say, you write it to uh, a file in the container and then it'll save it to S3 um, on the, after that uh, container finishes. Then it'll start the next container, the container reads from that artifact and then um, will turn it in, uh, will push it to the, uh, whatever the target is. So whether if that's Snowflake or Redshift or an S3 bucket, um, it'll write that there. So the separation of tap and target decouples the extract step and the load step, um, which means what you can do from an orchestration standpoint is you can have a, a templated tap and a templated target, um, and then a single workflow template that basically just accepts a tap name and accepts a target name. And then you, know, you, you just reuse that template over and over and over and over again. So as long as your tap container works, then you never have to change your target container. It just, you just reference it and it will, um, it will do this workflow for you. So I want you, I want to show you what this looks like. Here's the live demo. Um, hopefully this works. So this is the interface for Argo, uh, Argo workflows. <clears throat> we have single sign on connected. So uh, any one of my team can log in um, and take a look at it. This is the list of um, of all the workflows that are have been run in the past. Uh, yeah, I don't know, probably a couple of weeks or a week, maybe a week. Um, and you can see if you jump in here, you can see some some taps actually just ran. Um, so we have a, a a service called Clockify, which is what users uh, employees track hours, like customer service hours in. This this has an API, but it didn't have a um, anything in Stitch or Fivetran for us to download from. So we ended up writing a custom tap for this service and, um, and then referencing it here in this, um, in this workflow. So just to orient you a little bit, let me switch the, so you can, you know, it's got, it's, this is obviously interactive. You can click on a, um, you can click on a, a node in your DAG and you know look at information about the containers or uh, output. Um, basically, the way we have this structured is you have a, a master uh, node and then you have that's the tap to target. You have a tap node, a target node, and then um, I have some exit handler um, uh, nodes at the bottom here. So I'm just going to resubmit this actually and show you what this looks like as it's running. So you can see the first, the, the top node here is a um, this, this cron workflow node that runs on a schedule. So we have it set to run every eight hours. Um, you can see it's running now. It invokes a, uh, a workflow that has a couple of steps in it. So it has this workflow itself has the tap step and it has the target step in it. <clears throat> And then you can see this tap, uh, this tap container is running. If I looked at the logs here, it will show me uh, the logs from the, the Singer tap. And you can see here, it's basically saying, all right, we're, we're making a GET request to this API. We're pulling out um, logs. We're using a parameter of start date here and end date here. And all of this data is being saved into a, um, into a file in this container that will be written to S3 and then passed off to that target node. Um, you know, we can see different events from the uh, from the from the pod starting the container, creating the container, um, starting the wait container. So all of these all of these sorts of events and uh, information is probably familiar to you if you're familiar with yeah, most Kubernetes um, resources. So this is, I mean, from a um, from a UI perspective, I liked that 
uh, Argo workflows expose this um, and it gives me a place to to send other people on my team to, to look at the status of jobs um, and, and kind of stay updated. It's, you know, it's fairly bare bones. Um, you've got a list of your workflows that you've run. Um, you've got a list of uh, workflow templates that you uh, have created and cron workflows. Uh, and uh, you know a little bit of user information. It's so it's not like um, it, it gives it gave me everything we needed uh, for our team to get started with for, from an orchestration perspective. Oh, uh, we got a question. Um, this is from Tim, who had a previous experience working with Airflow, so it'll be interesting to c compare and contrast. Yep. You mentioned how are failures in or between steps or tasks handled. For example, connection failures between Kubernetes and S3 when transferring data, when writing data to S3 artifact. Yeah, so um, you can you can define like um, some some logic, right? So if um, if it if it fails, do this. If it doesn't fail, do this. Um, this is an example of a DBT uh, transformation run that failed, or this is a testing run. So you can see. This node uh, actually invoked two tests, it invoked a, a data test and a schema test. And you can see the data test passed and the schema test failed. Um, you know, this is, I would say this is one of the places where uh, I wish, it was hard for me to sort of get into the, the logs in some case, or to troubleshoot issues in some cases. Um, and the first approach that, that I took well, I'll, I'll talk about it. Basically, if, if it shows up in the logs, uh, it will show up here. And then you can also handle failures in, um, you know, using logic in the, in the templates. We have, what I have uh, in most of these production workflows is, is also an exit handler here, where um, after anything that happens on the workflow, um, it will either do a success message and like basically log some metadata to Snowflake and be done with it. But if it fails, it will send a Slack message um, to our, our Slack channel. And so what it's showing here is that, yeah, the exit handler succeeded in sending a fail message from this, um, from this node here. Does that answer the question? Tim, does that answer your question? Let's take a look. He said, cool, thanks. Is there, is there something like uh, retry parameters possible as well? Like automatically retrying a node in a DAG when it fails? Um, that's a good question. I, I would guess so. Um, I, don't, I don't know for certain, but I would guess so. And you know what? It's really good that you said that because some people might just immediately say, absolutely, under all any <laughs> circumstances. Um, but I think it's much better to say, as based on what you know, yes. And, and perhaps we can, we can continue the conversation later. It's no big deal. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. What, you know, just one comment from me um, generally on my like, experience is one of, the, one of the drawbacks with Argo over maybe an Airflow or a uh, Dagster or Prefect is that I think the, it, it seems to me that there are, are fewer people in the data community using Argo. And so there's a little less information out there and like, you know, you know stack overflow type of question, question answer. Um, resources out there for it. So there's a number of times where I've Argo, however, Argo is pretty fully fleshed. Um, and like a lot of the, the things that you need are in it. It's just, you have to do a little bit more work to like get that template of like exactly how, how you should write it. That's sort of my, you know, my two cents comment. I wouldn't. This man has a PhD. <laughs> Not in Argo workflow. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks, thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Tim. You can keep going. Okay. Um, all right. I'll show you what one of these um, one of these templates looks like in a minute. But I'll I'll jump back here. Okay. So our approach evolved over time. Um, you know, I've got these two these two resources, taps and targets. Uh, our first approach was to containerize everything. So like. Basically my development cycle was, uh, the output of our development cycle, I wanted a container that invoked the tap and that accepted some config parameters. And then, you know, then I just pull the container into the, the workflow and I would basically not have to do any logic in the workflow file itself. 
Um, you know, it, it makes writing the, the container file, the template file very easy because a lot of the logic was baked in, um, but it ended up being kind of a pain because we had to um, do development work on the container and then publish it to ECR um, in, in Amazon and then like make sure that was available for to the Kubernetes cluster for, um, for pulling the container. And it was like this long uh, publishing process once we wanted to move it to production. So what we have ended up doing now is basically writing um, everything into the config file. So the config, the tap config file uh, starts with a Python runtime. Um, so we use like Alpine, um, Python Alpine. And then we just have it mount the, the repositories, the GitHub repositories as folders in the, in the container and then just install them at runtime. And that's made it much easier to develop and test. Um, we can easily just uh, parameterize which branch of the repo we're gonna look at. So if you wanna develop, like do some development work, you can easily um, just reference a development branch and, you know, and see if the output's coming out right. So that has, um, that has improved our agility significantly. The con is that it's a little bit of a slower runtime because you have to install all these packages first. Um, when, when the tap actually runs, but generally that's not, not been a problem for us. So the strategy, um, the strategy for us looks something like this. And I guess the, the, the background you need to know is that in Argo, you can have a template workflow so that, um, you know, you can define a template and then just parameterize it uh, and invoke it at, at a given time so that you can standardize some, some processes. So we have um, a tap template and a target template. And the tap template just, like I said, installs a tap. You use environment variables uh, to set configuration parameters. And then there's a script, an entry point script that uh, we've created that will run the tap um, and save it to the right place. And the same basically goes for target. You, it, the, the template installs the target, you use config files or config uh, environment variables as configs, and then it runs an entry point script where it, um, where it knows which file to look for, for the, uh, the output artifacts, and then we'll upload them as necessary. Then we have a, a template that's just a tap to target template that basically says, take this tap, you know, uh, and then run, first run the tap, then run the target, and then I pass the this uh, container file or artifact file between the two, and then we just change. Uh, we create other files to that just change the tap and target name. So most of the complexity adding a new tap is basically creating this tap template, and then copying a cron workflow file um, and changing the, the tap name. So I've gotten our our new custom tap takes me probably you know, anywhere from one to three hours to deploy now. Uh, whereas, you know, originally it took me a while. And what's nice is that it all just, you know, is basically being managed in the exact same way. And if I have to change anything, I just change the, the tap itself um, in that repo. So it's, it has, it, I would say it's definitely been a boon for us. Um, you, and then of course you can orchestrate these things however you want. So once you have the, the tap template, if you wanted to like set one job that ran all of your taps every hour or something like that, you could do that. Um, you know, it, it's very composable. So you just have a higher level um, template or higher level workflow that invokes a bunch of smaller templates um, or you know, child templates and do it like that if you wanted to. We keep ours separate um, and just run it all, uh, you know, six or eight hours apart. Some, some of them are 24 hours, uh, but you could obviously compose it like this. And how do you do the, the monitoring for your TAPS or Argo workflow? Um, we, we use the Slack notifications. So we wrote an exit handler. Mm. Um, we wrote an exit handler that will just hit Slack if there's any failures. So we are, we're only getting notified on failures right now, but we are also working on having a more um, coherent like 
logging system. Um, so we have done some work with like open lineage um, data model and have a looker dashboard that will that that pulls data from Amuda, from DBT, from our Argo workflows, um, and will kind of expose whether there's any failures in any of the any of the tables. So that's sort of an area of active, like that's one of our next areas of focus. Um, Definitely. And this is a, an example of what the, the exit handler looks like. And definitely on my backlog to parse this a little better, but. <laughs> uh, so, you know, one final thing I'll, I'll say um, on the implementation side is we did write a, a couple of utility classes in Python to make it simpler to, uh, to containerize taps. Um, essentially, you know, each of our entry points for a new tap will, you know, re require this information. You know, what what is the command that needs to run to execute the, the what's the command line function that needs to run to execute the um, extraction process? What are the config keys required? Um, you know, are there any deviations from the default outputs and stuff like that? Those are all available if, um, and used in that tutorial that I mentioned at the beginning, if you wanna dig in. So, um, I can stop there if anyone has questions. No, 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 keep going, keep going. We got questions, but you can keep going. Okay. Um, well, I'll just show, I'll show one of these. Um, there's lots of example taps out there. Um, so lots of example taps out there. If you look, just look up Singer IO tap, Salesforce or tap, whatever, you can get a, a sense of what they look like. Here's one of our custom ones. Um, it's pretty easy to run. You basically, you know, clone the repo, um, install it, and then just run this function. This is true for all Singer taps. This is like basically how it works is you have a, a config file, you have a catalog file, and, um, and then you just run it with those two parameters and it will output that stream of, of exported data. Um, so what our templates look like in Argo workflows, they look a little bit like this. So our Singer workflow template I mentioned earlier is um, it invokes the, the tap and the target itself. This is what that might look like um, if you wanted to implement it. You have a, at the top, you have the kind of standard Kubernetes, um, you know, resource metadata, resource kind, I keep saying resource, I hope it's not operator, but uh, then you have a, a, a spec, a workflow spec you specify an entry point and then a number of templates. So when the workflow starts, that, that's the whole DAG, when the workflow starts, it's gonna invoke the, the tap to target template, which is defined here. And then this is a, uh, this template has a couple of steps in it. And specifically it has two steps or three steps. It has um, the tap, has the target, and then it saves the uh, state file, which I didn't talk about, but. Um, a little extra. But all of these steps are invoking other templates. And so um, essentially, you know, you, you define even, even within a workflow template, you're defining like container templates that can operate against each other. Um, and so, you know, as you can see here, essentially what we're, what we're looking at is, is adding, um, you know, parameterizing a lot of the, um, the things that you might want to that, that go into the taps and targets uh, at this higher level. Hopefully I didn't have any passwords and stuff in there. Good data governance. <laughs> I'll have to change them all. Uh, so, and then this is what something like, uh, you know, a Slack tap might look like. You've got, um, uh, we've got an invoking of that tap to target workflow from earlier um, in, in a, a template at that higher level. So you, know, you can see it's as simple as specifying, hey, use this uh, template, um, move it to push it to this schema, and then it runs every, um, 20, every 24 hours. Okay, um, and just to close out here. So just a couple considerations um, you know, that, that have come from us. The Argo is working well. I have no complaints um, from, from a running perspective. It took a while. I would say it took a while to, um, to get things to the, the state that we wanted and, and ideally, but it's not, um, 
but now I, I have, I, we have no, no problems with it. Um, it. It was working great. And the reason it took us a while was just because of unfamiliarity and it's the first time we were doing it and we kind of, you know, learn as you go type of thing. Um, we've added other functionality. So we use Argo to push data out of the warehouse as well. So, you know, little scripts that can read data and then push it to Salesforce or whatever. We use it to orchestrate transform jobs. So it's becoming very um, multi-purpose for sure. It's not too hard for other people on my team to add, um, to create new templates either. Uh, the con it's a container and it has the second benefit of like aligning everyone with a Kubernetes, um, sort of a Kubernetes framework. So I don't have people kind of developing in a language that I don't, I don't know, or, um, you know, we can't, we can't get other support on. There's other extensions of Argo as well. So Argo, the big project has workflows, events, um, Argo, shoot, it has, it has three other like projects, including like event sensors that can create, kick off a, a workflow via trigger. And then also GitOps type of, of stuff where you're, um, you're deploying code to your Argo environment, Argo CD, um, deploying code based on, you know, Git commits and stuff. That is sort of a future state that I'd love to get to, but we're, you know, it's probably not top priority now. There's a couple of things if you're starting a, you know, starting a new team um, or new project, I would consider thinking to yourself. Um, the first is, do you need a custom, you know, do you, are, do you have a need for custom data, data loaders? Um, it introduces a lot of complexity if you have to, um, if you do, if you can't just pay for it uh, out of the box, but. Yeah, quick, quick, question question with that, quick question with that regarding those tools, like five train, et cetera. Did you, have you considered open source tools um, such as Airbyte or other options that might be available? Yeah, so Airbyte's a good example. So Airbyte is relatively new um, and they, uh, I don't know if they use something or Meltano is another one that mm -hmm. is a more, um, that has the orchestration layer kind of built in as well. Um, I, we did, we did look into Meltano a little bit, but this was before their pivot to like focus on data replication. So since we were using DBT already, we didn't really have the need for, for Meltano, but definitely consider those other, those other options. Yeah. Um, you could still, I mean, even if you went with one of those, you could still use Argo to, um, to orchestrate it though, depending on, depending on the tool. <clears throat> uh, how much other, you know, how much, how many other uh, processes are you going to use for an orchestrator? And then I think the bigger ones are, um, does Kubernetes architecture fit with the rest of the company's infrastructure? So there's a reason to use Kubernetes. Um, do you have experts outside of your team who could step in and help with network problems and, you know, provide guidance on, um, on things like that? Do, um, do you have the experience to look at the log, you know, understand the logging files and um, troubleshoot things? And why not use Airflow, Prefect, or Dagster? I'd love to hear from people on, on why they would prefer not to use Airflow or Prefect or Dagster. Um, because, because I think that's probably what it comes down to. Um, Argo is, is really useful is really useful and it's cloud native, which I really like. Um, but then Dagster, for example, is really I think focused on the data team and the data team users and probably has a lot of functionality that is competitive um, and, and uh, might be more specific to, uh, to some of our needs. I don't know though, I haven't had, I haven't had firsthand experience of it. <clears throat> uh, this is just reiterating kind of the same thing. Kind of the same point about um, you know troubleshooting is is maybe the biggest pain point because there's not a lot of there's not a big Argo workflows data community out there, not a lot of not as many um, posts on Stack Overflow or anything like that, and um, and and I think it's just not as uh, you get the logs from the containers, but then there's like nothing additional that would help you troubleshoot um, built into the product. But other than that, um, other than we, that, we've had a great experience. And, and like you said, it comes down to matching sort of up with the buyer persona and then some things that might relate to, you know, developer experience and things of that nature in a similar way. And, and once again, in no, by no means, you know, have tons of experience on this. 
If you look at, you know, there could be a JavaScript developer who's been, you know, writing code for years, and then someone who's using Google Tag Manager who thinks they can do something similar and wants to be like, hey, wait a minute, you know, you haven't really put your time in in terms of expertise. But I think that's what a lot of this comes down to is use cases, match with profiles, the previous technology stack they've been working with. Um, so that's what I have a lot to do with. We got another question right here. What is your um, main issue with Argo workflows currently? And what is your uh, main reason why Argo workflows is so awesome? Um, Philosophical question, no pressure. No, I will say, <clears throat> I would say one of our main issues early on, I think had to do with focusing on that container-based approach, um, which was just not, I think it was the wrong decision. Um, now that we've switched to using like to, to, to baking a lot of that stuff into the container, the templates themselves, I actually really like, um, I really like that because everything is in uh, a YAML file, right? The whole DAG is in a YAML file. I've got the templates. It's like, uh, and, and so it's all version controlled. Um, it's all reusable. Uh, I can point people on my team specifically to where that is. I don't know how it looks in like um, Dagster or Airflow, but I would guess that the Argo workflow YAML files are pretty straightforward um, to, to kind of parse and understand what's happening versus, <clears throat> versus some of these other orchestrators that have a lot of like decorator functions and um, they're written in Python, which a lot of people aren't as familiar with. So that's what I really like about Argo is that um, the ease of putting together a new, a new template. And it's just, um, you know, it's just really cool <laughs> to be able to run it, kind of run it from the command line and, uh, uh, to just see it like pop up really quick. And, you know, you have that, you have that interactivity of, um, uh, of Kubernetes, you know, of Kubernetes, uh, of any other like Kubernetes resource where you, you see it popping up and you see the lifecycle management and you can kind of scale it out and, and stuff like that. All right, very good. Another question, um, based on all of this as well too, do you imagine, I guess, I guess we kind of talked about it because it may depend on, you know, the technical background, and preferences that would go along with that. But do you imagine that there are going to be more folks out there that are going to start using that are going to start using Argo inside the data space? We can say more on the traditional data engineering uh, side of things, and then also perhaps for folks that aren't as technical in that area. Yeah. So my understanding is that is that um, ML Flow, for example, or maybe Kubeflow, um, is uh, built yes. on Argo. Yeah. You know, so it's, I think it's being used. It might be like, people might not realize they're using it um, in some cases. <clears throat> I think it definitely has a, um, it has a space there. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know enough about the, like, I don't want to predict <laughs> the future, uh, uh, you know, of, of the, of the tool or anything like that. Cause I just don't, I don't know. The space is evolving so quickly. I know that like I hear about Dagster all the time and people getting excited about Dagster, but for people who are more probably coming from more of the, the DevOps, like they're really familiar with Kubernetes. I think Argo workflows is a great way to kind of get started. Um, and it's not like, there's no reason you can't have you know, in some ways, there's no reason you can't have both, right? You can't, there's no reason you can't have Dagster for the, the specific data team. And then you have other, these other processes that are um, running in, in Argo, um, you know, that are kind of maybe managed more by the engineering resources. Um, mm. So I don't, I don't think it's necessarily a, you know, winner, it's not necessarily a winner takes all because I think the audiences are, are in some cases uh, quite different. Once again, we're talking to a person who studied both chemistry and philosophy. Lives in three <laughs> lives in three counties simultaneously. Refuse to live. <laughs> refuse to live one. So it's good, but I, I, I can't choose. An, I can't commit. You know. Then for the thing, but maybe, I think that, maybe people use it. Maybe what I want. I don't know. Yeah, but I think that's the beauty of it. You know, it's like why is that? I I find that sometimes in this space, and you know, we can talk about this. Uh, we've talked about this before in other meetups. Is that how militant some folks can get about you know worshiping a tool and things like that? Um, I think it and that can always get a little bit uh, a little bit slippery. Um, so it's it's good to be open minded and to think about as, as you were saying on seeing how these things are evolving. To always be asking you know where things going to be going, how we're doing things right now is going to be different. There are learning curves, adaptation processes, all that kind of stuff. I think the cultural and, and mentality that we all need to have is to try to be more empathetic and and anticipate you know, uh, some changes that we may not like, but just to be, you know, lifelong learners. 
uh, and as someone who spent a very long time learning and studying, um, I think that uh, you're, you're someone who definitely knows that quite well. Um, yeah, Stephen, so one, one thing yeah, that ahead. reminds me of one thing that reminds me of that is probably a good point to just kind of end on is or underscore at the end is um, Argo's container native. I mean, so it's like so when you think about Python and you know you know all these all these different um, flavor de jours like containers aren't going anywhere. And, uh, and so that is one thing that is really nice about Argo is as long as it can be expressed in a container, you can put it in your DAG and, and go on. Now I know like Airflow and, and all these others have container nodes and stuff. You, there's no reason you can't do it, do it there as well, but um, it is nice that it's container native. Okay, that is, I think that is a fair point. And that's because the thing is because a lot of the technologies that we're talking about, some predated containers, some, you know, came along at the same time. Others, we talk about, you know, cloud native, Kubernetes native, things that were designed with that in mind. And that's one of the big questions that actually comes up as well, too, with Kubernetes in general, and particularly the issue of running data on Kubernetes, is that folks will say it wasn't designed with running data and stateful workloads in mind. So, you know, that has to be kind of shoehorned in. And there are lots of conversations about that. And I, I think that we're still very much in the early phases of those, of those conversations, but we'll see how they evolve um, in, in the future. Uh, that being said, we've done, this is meetup number 37. We have another meetup tomorrow. We have two meetups on Thursday. So we're increasingly confident that we're, you know, not these like wild lost prophets in the wilderness <laughs> shouting about something that doesn't make any sense. But finding use cases all over the world. Like I said, tomorrow we'll have a meetup in Spanish on Thursday as well. Um, we're doing meetups in Portuguese. Anybody who speaks any other languages is always welcome to do it. It's just good to see that other people are kind of saying the same thing. So it's not just, you know, one, only one message being used again and again. And it's interesting. It's, it's also cool to be meeting folks that are like, oh yeah, I've, you know, I've been thinking about this since I started working with Kubernetes, you know, why couldn't things be done statefully and things like that. Um, so the, all these things are very encouraging for us to see. That being said, um, I'm, Stephen, I may have to ask you to stop sharing your screen because we're, we are getting to the end and we have a little bit of a tradition. In the beginning of the meetup, you met Angel and Gorka, if you can share our screen now. Um, Angel is our secret spy who, while we are talking, is creating a visual summary of the things that we're talking about. So you can see now on my screen. Uh, I think he did a pretty good job. And I think there's a lot of stuff that could be dealt with that he chose, uh, artistically speaking, because you were talking a lot about taps. Um, so I think there's a lot that can be done there. Metaphors related to water. We could think about beer. We could think about coffee. We could think about lots of different things. Um, but this idea of a constant flow of data and coming out of taps. So anyway, I thought that was, I thought that was quite nice. Nice visual summary. Oh, wow, that's beautiful. That's amazing on how. Yeah. Angel's really good. He's really, really good. So wow. that's one piece. And then Steven, if it's okay with you, cause we got a couple of minutes left. Gorka, can you share the lyrics? We have a tradition, Steven, you may have noticed in our social media, but I do, I create raps for every, um, for every meetup that we do. And this is the first time that, uh, we, we kind of have like different philosophies about should we do the right before, should we do after, but this is the first time that we're gonna read the lyrics together, all right? So let's see, um, I need to make my screen a little bit better, bigger. You, there may be some things that, um, I think, because we're, we're all sharing our screen, good. So we'll, let's take a look at this together. Can you read the first line? <clears throat> all right. Argo, that's Affleck, Bella Tones, Stones, Throw, that's Steven. Perfect. Good. So we know Argo, obviously, you know, the, the film by Ben Affleck, Argo, you may have seen it, you may not have. Um, and so, but then this is a, this is a switch. So Bella Fleck is a banjo player who's a jazz musician. So that's why that changed. And then Tones, because of music, because his group is called Bella Fleck and the Fleck Tones. Then so Stones Throw, that Stephen, Stones Throw, because St. Stephen was the first martyr who was stoned to death. Um, yeah. So yeah, I always got to, I got to get my degree in there too, man. <laughs> so the second one the second one really has no additional meaning it was just words that rhyme with steven so believe in it's even sleeves bereaved even she's the beacon that was the whole attempt to get to the next line of uh, this is really old school maybe yeah. beacon. beacon oh my gosh <laughs> that's old school all right so maybe beacon typing i mean scripture with python's mixture because i knew the python was going to be mentioned so then we get to the next one. So picture Tyson is just a way to throw Mike Tyson in Python. Um, shakes and breaks, the quakes off your Richter. Richter, thinking of earthquakes, rhymes with mixture. And then so airflow to Dagster. Nah, that's outdated like Napster. Just because I was thinking Dagster, what has a stir in it? 
<laughs> and also you can remember Napster, I'm sure. Um, talking about data governance and privacy and intellectual property. So now the next one was a little bit funny because I started just thinking about how can I play with the word Stephen? And thinking about all the different Stevens because in the beginning mentioning St. Stephen, the first martyr. So haphazardly bother Rogers, but Stephen, not Mr. So Stephen Rogers, do you know who Stephen Rogers is? It's a comic book yeah, character. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's- it's Captain America, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Good job. So, yeah. so I was like, okay, so Steven, Steven Rogers, not Mr. Rogers. Right, so that's why I put that. Um, that's a captain. You're tapped out because you're also talking a lot about tapping. So Steven Thompson is a mixed martial arts fighter who's really, really good. His career, is unfortunately, has declined a little bit, but very, very good mixed martial artist. So I, I decided to put that. And they call him the Wonder Boy. So that's why I put that and then pop him like a blister because blister is with mister. Then we get to the next one. And there is a spelling mistake here for which I apologize. So lead singer, you were talking about singer, all right? So like Steve Tyler from Aerosmith. Once again, we got another Steven. And then got more kicks than Seagal. All right, Steven Seagal, that's actually misspelled. Um, so I apologize for that. And then so take a muta to Bermuda, my angle's a triangle. All right, that's also a, me- a reference to mixed martial arts because the triangle choke. Um, fixed plans with three walls. That doesn't mean anything. It just ranches with Seagal. Um, and then so Bailey double on the daily. All right, so thinking of daily double from Jeopardy. All right, rest in peace, yeah, Alex yeah. Trebek. Um, and then on the daily, total request live. You're old enough that you probably remember that from MTV, total request live yep, yep, with yeah. Carson Daly. All right, so then yep. that's how we got, we linked that back. So he's a philosophical chemist. And so I was actually asking you yesterday about what kind of philosophy you like. And you mentioned existentialism. So I got to get that in there as well. Um, the premise existentialist igniting that's arson. Once again, silly things, but just fun to do. So the rap video will come out tomorrow. And so you'll get to see how we put this together. But I think it's fun because if not, sometimes it's just like, oh, is it just like a bunch of words put together? And sometimes that's really is the case. But um, but this is always a fun thing to do to be able to mix the technology. And then, like I said, another way of looking at it. So finishing with both Angel's amazing visual representation and then my very poor high school attempt at poetry is <laughs> so, <laughs> always a lot of fun. So anyway, Stephen, are there any other things that we need to know in terms of places where we can find you, Twitter, blogs, things like that? No, I mean, hit me up in the um, in the in the data on Kubernetes committee community. I'm in the Singer community, DBT. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm around. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah, you're kind of a big deal. Um, but I will say this to everybody as well: Stephen's very open to answering questions, so just reach out whenever you get a chance. Um, Stephen, thank you so much for your time today. I think we all learned a lot, and we'll definitely be continuing the conversation in Slack. Um, and we'll hope to have you back later this year. And if not that next year, be well, stay safe in all three counties, wherever you may be. And uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, Bart. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.